Welcome to Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday, and we're going to get back into the series on lukewarm. Number one, we do these videos to encourage everyone that, as well as myself, we can enjoy a more tangible or real relationship with God. I know we've used that word tangible, but God's supposed to be real. Now, let me just share this thought. As soon as you say tangible, you want to equate God to being real to the physical world. But God is always real to the spiritual world. He is a spirit, and you are a spirit. And we want to get better at having our spiritual senses become alive to spiritual things like our physical senses are to physical things. So the more accurate we can become in the way that we do life, and doing life just means your perspective. Why do you choose what you choose? Why do you do what you do? There has to be some sense of reality to it in order for you to go in the direction you're going. I mean, why do you go the direction you go? Well, as you say, I'm going to church. See, there's purpose in it. There's reality in it. You believe in the way that you're going. You believe in the direction you're heading. Well, in a like manner, we need to believe and experience and believe and experience the direction that we're headed spiritually so that things begin to come alive. Now, that doesn't mean that it stays. Things in the spiritual world or God in the spiritual world stays just to the spirit. We see too many experiences in the word of God where God was very real to the, to the physical world as well, as well. We know God created our physical bodies to become the container of the real us. And so that container is touched by the spiritual life of the spirit that's inside of that body. Very simply, when that spirit leaves that body, the body then is no longer functioning. It's dead according to the earthly world is concerned. But the spirit, the real you, has never died. It goes on living. And we trust that your relationship in Jesus Christ uh, allows you the confidence of knowing that you, you will spend eternity with him. I'm saying all these things because it means a lot for us to open our heart to God being real in every dimension, not only spiritually, but also physically, also mentally, the Spirit of God becoming real to your whole person. So this is the reason why we do these videos, for God to be real. Number two, for your faith to be more effective and your prayers to be answered. And number three, that you would take your testimonies and begin to share those with others around you. Well, you know, we've always used uh, Matthew eleven twenty seven to 30 in the Message Bible as our text, and we continue to do so. Hopefully some of you that have watched this many times, and oh, I found out this is our 200th video. Yay, 200. I, I'm thinking more like 80. <laughs> and, and Chloe sends me that we've already done 199. So this must be our 200th. Wow. Think about how many videos we've done. And we're just scratching the surface. You know, there's so much more. We could go on for another couple of years with just new things to share. And all these things, you know, I'm, I'm sharing these things. And I realize that you may look at me and think, wow, look at how much he knows. But I have to review for all of these things as well. There's much, much to see through the truth of the Word of God and how we function in life with our application that we could teach and go on and on and on for a long time. And so I continue to be refreshed and blessed with these videos as well because it's a refresher to me of some things that I've done before, pulling up some of that information. Then even as the scripture over here in, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 to 9, it says, test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not mere hearsay, that uh, Jesus Christ is in your life. And so I need to do that as much as anybody else, to continue to refresh and continue to go over and over things that help me to see better, to uh, a word, differentiate between what is good and what is not, what is helpful, what is not helpful, what is accurate, what is real, to put my focus, my attention, my words, my thought, the intent of my heart on those things. And this is how we begin to progress spiritually. So now here we are with the passage of Scripture, uh, 27, uh, 2 through 30, Matthew chapter 11, from the Message Bible. Now Jesus resumed talking, but now tenderly. 
The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father and son relationship coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the father the way the son does, nor the son the way the father does, but I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Well, let's not, let's not take any more time but to jump right into our thoughts here. Very simply, our verses that we've used for lukewarm is, number one, grace is a teacher. Titus 2, 11 and 12, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we may live soberly, righteous, and godly in the present age. Notice the last time we made the observation that to let go of that which is negative is already to begin to experience that which is positive. In other words, you don't have to seek for God as much as you do have to let go and turn, <coughs> excuse me, turn away from the world that has captured your attention so that then you're free to be attentive to the things of the Spirit because they're all around you at all times. God is with you. You can be confident of that. Jesus made sure right before he left, he told us, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So then we come down to 2 Corinthians 13, 5 to 9, and we've already started that. We don't have to finish it, but there's an examination, <coughs> excuse me, and a test that you need to be taking on a regular basis. For what purpose? Just to see if that which you're learning and growing in is developing to the place where you're having testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. This is very important. I wish people had been doing this for a very, very long time. We might not be in the place that we're in. Maybe 20 years ago, people would have been assessing, you know, we're learning a lot of knowledge, but we're not seeing as much, near as much outflow and experience of that knowledge. What's wrong here? Why are we not? Because if I go to tech school and I learn something that day about how to work with certain uh, saws and tools according to the wood shaping that I want to do, shouldn't the afternoon class where I'm now in the shop, shouldn't I be able to actually implement those things I just learned? Or do I learn things and pass them on a test, but I can't actually produce them in life. These are really good thoughts, everybody. We don't do life this way. We make a demand on things to work. I mean, even when we go out to eat, you know what, not, not to be ugly, but I mean, if you were brought a steak when you ordered a nice piece of salmon, wouldn't you say to the server, did something happen with the order? Well, why? Well, did I not order salmon? Well, let me look. Yes, you did. I said, well, I got a steak. Oh, I'm so sorry. We'll take care of that right now. Or would you just say, you know, they probably just ran out of salmon, so they gave me a steak and said, oh, how thoughtful for them. You would at least question that because you're paying for it. In other words, if you went to the grocery store to have a meal of salmon, you wouldn't buy a steak or a ribeye or a filet or a sirloin. No, you'd get salmon so that you could come home and cook what you desired. That's why you have money to pay for what you actually desire to get. We hold a standard in the world of that which we actually put our intention upon. We desire and almost demand much of the time that that become true. Why can't we hold that standard to the things of the spiritual world? To what do you degree do you think that God operates in heaven with the idea that most of what he says never really comes to pass and the angels don't know whether to believe him or not to believe him because it's kind of like crying wolf. You know, you never know. Well, we'll go on to the next verse. It says, therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. Talking about lukewarm, meaning we start a particular direction and a particular way, but then we just let it all go, if you will. The idea of letting it go to seed like 
okay, well, didn't you kind of really apply yourself for a couple of years in this direction? What happened? Why would you just let it all go? Why would you start out so well and finish so poorly? Well, Paul seemed to ask the Galatians the same thing. I mean, who has bewitched you that you would start in the spirit and then end up in the flesh? Why do these things happen? And again, now we're bringing to you a mindset that exists in so many of us, and I'm saying us because I have to weed, pull weeds, weed this out of my own life. Because when you've not necessarily been accustomed to getting an actual answer, then you change with the wind. One moment you're really seeking God, the next moment, oh, well, you know, it just didn't. Well, you know, if Enoch would have given up, he never would have found God. But he not only found him because he searched for him diligently, and he did it by faith. So he wasn't doing it based on what he saw or what he found. He was doing it based on what he believed. And based on what he believed, he continued until he found I think sometimes our idea of faith is to say, well, we're going to believe God for this, but then as soon as it doesn't happen, we immediately assume that we can just abandon ship, so to speak, and go a different direction because there's so many options in the world that we never see anything through. The old saints used to pray things through. Now, I wasn't involved in that when I was young. You know, we didn't pray anything through when it came to our, our, my understanding as I grew up. You, you, you prayed and then you, if you didn't see it, wasn't God's will. It was all the sovereignty of God. God's sovereignty would make some sick and make some healed. And, and if someone got healed, it was special. It wasn't normal and regular to be expected in an everyday experience because no one ever saw it. So now do you understand it? When, when I read a verse, Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, when I read a verse like that, therefore we do not cast away our confidence, which has great recompense or reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you will receive the promise. We don't go backwards. We're always going forwards. A relationship with God never retreats. It never questions. It always goes forward. And if what you don't see today, you'll see tomorrow because your faith isn't based on seeing. Your faith is based on what you believe in God and because of what you believe, that's the reason why you see. So we're going forward. Lukewarm is all about just kind of taking one step forward, one step back, two steps forward, four steps back. We never seem to really get anywhere. Sad but true. And this is one of the reasons why distinction is so important. When you understand distinction, meaning what actually is and what actually isn't. And that's the reason why the more accurate something is that's good, the more completely accurate something bad is that's bad, the easier it is for you to make the kind of choice that connects you to that which is good. And what we have in the church world is, is so much of what the world has infiltrated us in a mentality of compromise a mentality of weakness. And I so dislike the idea that in my life there's still some areas of weakness because I'm someone that really has all my life endeavored to be a person of strength and conviction. But there are still some areas where I'm not as convicted and that bothers me. And so I have to do those tests, you see open my heart up, and subject myself to the bigger questions, which then come back, back down to my character. And wow, that's hard. But folks, we're not beating ourselves up. We know who we are in Christ. But how do we function in life? Because who we are in Christ will take form and shape and functionality when we're very absolute and we become very uh, easily distinguishable about what is and what isn't. I can't say it any better than that. That's why Jesus will get over here to Revelation where he talks about hot or cold versus lukewarm. But for a moment here, I'm just gonna bring the subject up because it's a subject that is really true. And, and we all have to be open to the idea. Matthew 26, 18 to 26, I'm not gonna read everything, but you know, 
Uh, he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They prepared the Saf a Passover. Verse 20, when the evening had come, they sat down with the 12. Now as they were eating, he said, surely I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? And of course, now all of a sudden, we've introduced to you the whole idea of, idea of Jesus excuse me, being betrayed by Judas and Judas beginning to kick around the ideas from those voices which are causing him to want to compromise his dedication and commitment to Jesus for that which is of the flesh and the world. You know, I mean, the parable of the sower said it, you know, that third soil where the other weeds grow up with uh, that which is accurate and true, and it begins to choke it out because it represents people that are caught up in the world, in money, in the things of the world, the cares of life. And Judas is one of those guys. And we see here, and I don't want to get into reading every bit of it, but, you know, Jesus, of course, then looks at Judas as he comes over to him and says, you know, the one that dips is the one that it is, his bread and sups with me. And, of course, Judas did. And then he looked at Judas and said, go and do what you need to do. Well, the disciples didn't put two and two together. They thought maybe what Jesus was saying was go and handle the money, you know, and take care of the money and, and, and make sure everything is, is settled or something versus what Judas was doing was going to betray Jesus. And then, of course, you know, we see how well that worked out for Judas. It's over in, you know, uh, you've got, oh, where is this now? Matthew 27, 1 to 5, verse 3. Then Judas's betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, uh, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So how well did that work for Judas? Again, what we're bringing to pass here is the idea that you could be all in and then you can end up being all out. See, it's, it's lukewarm that doesn't establish itself in that which is completely 100% accurate. And that's what happens so much. We get watered down in our salvation because we allow so much of the world to come in and we don't push it back and we don't become all the way absolute or 100% for Jesus. <clears throat> and then what begins to take place? Well, slowly there's an erosion of that which used to be so real. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this story. And, and I'm just trying not to be a casualty myself by continuing to let God be real in my life. But how many times I've talked with individuals that I love and that are friends that tell me stories of, you know, 30 years ago when they got in the word of faith and the kind of faith that they believed God for and they would not budge, would not move and God just came through and miracles took place that did not have to do with medical science. It was all what God did. And then I see some of these same people today and everything about their life physically is always connected now to medical science. It's like there's such a shift in their life. And even though they still throw out, I'm believing God, I'm believing God, believe with me, I'm believing God. Their whole paradigm is shifted to medical science. It's not the way they used to talk. Things have changed. And I don't want that kind of backward change. Do you? Here's a real good grace story right here. It uh, comes from some folks uh, that are actually in another country. And it says, hi, hi. From Trinidad, my husband and I have been enjoying Adventures in Grace. You have inspired us to look for our own adventures each day. That's why we're doing this, so that you would look for your own adventures each day. Perfect, perfectly said. Thank you. You have okay. We have been, we have even been journaling our Grace adventures. You know what, everybody? That's a great idea. And I'm not a journaler, so if I said that right, but you know what? I need to be. This is so perfect. I like what they're saying. Recently, I got a flat tire while driving and had to pull into a tire shop. As the attendant checked it, he said that I needed a new tire. I realized that I didn't have the ATM card on me, but I did have some cash, which was for my brother. As I was about to take out the cash, and thought to, the thought came to me that I shouldn't have to use my brother's money to pay for the tire, so I started praying in other tongues. As I looked across, the guy was putting back my tire on the vehicle and told me the cost was $30 when previously had told me I needed a new tire, which was $550. 
Thank you, Lord, for grace. Isn't that just like the Lord to just take a moment and listen? And they, they, they didn't just pull out the money. Something said don't. Now he prays in other tongues. As they begin to turn their face toward God, what does grace do? Grace is always there to do this for everybody, but many people pay the 550 because we don't take the little nuances of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life as seriously as we could. So as we learn to get rid of lukewarm, these things will become more real to you. Well, praise the Lord. Go to jhmi at jimhockaday.com, which is our email, and share your grace story just like you heard it today. Bless you. See you next time.